The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 159. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Welcome back to the EL. Today we have Jay Papasan, co-author of The One Thing, The Surprisingly Simple Truth Behind Extraordinary Results. Guys, this is one of my favorite books and, and honestly, one of the favorite people. I, I, I say that from time to time, but uh, uh, throughout the 150, 60 plus interviews, this was a, a top five interview. I loved having Jay on. Uh, so real, so passionate about the actual topic. And so I think you're going to get a ton out of it. This book, uh, without me even saying anything, you guys have probably already heard of the book. It's been out for two years or almost two years now and is wildly popular. We've had it referenced a couple of times on the show. So without further ado, I, I don't need to promote this. This book is 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 that good and it's it's uh, the content speaks for itself. So without further ado, let's bring on Jay. Welcome, Jay. And thank you for joining us on the Entrepreneur's Library. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Before we take a deep dive into the one thing, will you take just a moment to introduce yourself? Tell us just a little bit about you personally. Sure. Uh, my name is Jay Papazan. I live in Austin, Texas. My wife runs a highly successful real estate team here called the Papazan Property Group. And we have two kids, Gus and Veronica. Um, in the big picture, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, spent about 20 years in publishing uh, before settling with my family here in Austin to, instead of being an editor, be a writer. Excellent. So Jay, thank you for sharing that first off. And now let's jump right into your book, The One Thing, uh, which was originally made available for purchase back April of 2013. And Jay, we're going to move quickly, but our whole goal here is to cover the top questions that our listener slash future reader would like to get answered. And the first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing The One Thing? Well, my co-author is Gary Keller, and he founded Keller Williams Realty, uh, which is now the largest real estate uh, franchise company in the world with 111,000 associates around the globe. And when I joined him, I think we were number 14. We weren't even in all 50 states, but we were still the fastest growing. And in the course of working on an education piece for the company, I was writing with him on some real estate books and he wrote an essay called The Power of One. And I had this aha, because I'd been in publishing for a long time. It's like, well, this is Gary's one thing. This is it. Um, the thing that Gary does better as an entrepreneur than anyone else is not the smartest guy, although he is really smart. He doesn't try to work longer hours, though he works really hard. He's able to identify the priority, and he's willing to give it more time at the expense of a lot of other priorities in order to be as successful as possible. And he's also practical. So as soon as I read that eight-page essay, which took our company by storm, um, we dug in and we spent about five years researching and trying to identify exactly his techniques and how they lined up with other successful entrepreneurs. And that was kind of the birthplace. It was just an essay he wrote over a weekend called The Power of One. Excellent. So you and I were talking beforehand. What was the number of books that came out last year? Did you tell me a oh, number? You know, every year there's something crazy like 300,000 books that come out. And in the business category, I think like 9,000 books. It's wow. really astounding to be in the business category to really kind of keep track of it. Hey, you've got to figure out what are the books that are a priority for me to pay attention to as an entrepreneur, right? Because you can't read yeah. them all. So, so that, that leads into our next question, which is, you know, what makes your book different from others regarding the same or similar topic? Um, I think there's a lot of books that hit the big idea, right? Less is more. Um, that's not a new idea, and we don't pretend that it is. I think that the combination of the way I write and the way Gary thinks is we're both very practical. I, I love big idea, idea books because they change the way I see the world. But I think that we've actually got a proven system. We've been doing it in our company, Keller Williams, not just here with Gary, but through all of our franchisees. This focus and how you implement that on a really simple, practical way, I think that's the difference maker. Um, We've been now like translated into 22 languages, and I think that the resonance for the book is because people go, wait, I've heard this forever, but I think now I can do it. Excellent. And Jay, how would you say that you guys designed the book as far as how do you suggest the reader engage? Is this one they can 
jump out or jump in and out and cherry pick information as needed? Or did you guys really design it to be read from front to back? Um, you know, I love that question because we worked with a very special publisher, Ray Bard, and he does one book a year and they've almost all been bestsellers, right? What better company to work with? Um, and so we had his full attention and we started asking, look, this book is about priority and putting the first things first. Um, shouldn't we write the book that way? And so the book is organized from, you know, like all books, there's the big idea up front. Um, we have a section called the lies, you know, which is kind of getting some of the big things out of your head before we talk about here's the simple truth. And then there's some commitments that we ask people to make to kind of sustain it later on. But we literally organized the book as teachers and coaches by what they needed first. So like the copyright page, every book you open up in the first three or four pages, there'll be a copyright page. You're going to find that at the end of our book. Because we're like, what, what use does a reader have of this? We actually have had librarians call us and say it's missing. And we're like, no, I'm sorry, we put it in the back. Because we want it. I mean, entrepreneurs think this way. Tell me what matters, and I'm out of here because I'm doing it already. And we tried to design the book for them. No, that's perfect. So now that we, Jay, now that we know the, the background, uh, the purpose of the book, let's take a deep dive into the content itself. We take the next five, eight, maybe even 10 minutes and really give the, the future reader that's listening right now a great idea of what they're going to get at or what they should be able to get out of your book. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the idea that we're talking about, I think there's a um, Reed Hastings, the guy who founded Netflix, he said, I'd always rather be selling aspirin uh, than vitamins, right? Aspirin, my headache goes away. Vitamins, eh, I'm not sure what's happening, but I believe something's happening. So when you think about the beginning of the book, we try to identify the, both the pain, you know, the aspirin and the vitamin. And so I think that we're living as business people in a time through technology, through a connected flat world where we have unlimited opportunity. Um, the things that we can say yes to in terms of business opportunities, in terms of people, networking opportunities are really crazy. And we haven't evolved to have an understanding of what we really need to say no to. So I think that you look at most people out there and they feel kind of an oppressive sense of obligation in, around all the things that they're juggling. And so that's the pain point. And we've heard it loud and clear from professionals they just feel like their days are broken out in 15-minute increments and that they understand that they're stressed out because they're doing too much. Um, the flip side, kind of the promise, is a concept and it's a metaphor we pull through the book. It's the domino effect. It's this idea like when you were a kid, you lined up dominoes so that you could knock over one and have them all fall down. And it's that principle, we called it you know, the domino effect, that one thing can make many things happen. Many things happen. So... We, we looked into it, like the world record is like 4.5 million dominoes. So the extent to which you can have a lot of things happen by doing just one thing is longer than most people think. And just for fun, we actually found like an article in the American Journal of Physics that proves that a two-inch domino can knock over a three-inch domino, can knock over a four-and-a-half-inch domino. Just the physical nature of it, a domino can knock over one that's 50% bigger. So if you took that out, just 57 dominoes, starting with a two-inch domino, but growing at that exponential rate, the 57th domino would reach almost all the way from the Earth to the moon. And we graphed it out in the book, and it's popular with kids because they get this. It's a physical kind of idea that things can grow at this race and rate. And in the beginning, you don't think anything's happening, but pretty soon you're like, whoa, by the 31st, it's taller than Everest. And we believe that when you're doing the one thing that's the right thing as a professional or as a business person, that most businesses follow that same arc. Um, we even hired um, an intern in our private equity group, Keller Capital, um, to go and look at you know, what Fortune listed as the top 100 businesses of the last century. And on average, even though a lot of them were supposedly overnight successes, it took eight and a half years for them to, quote, be successful. A lot of people think it happens quickly, but the big results are a little bit farther away than most people expect. So we kind of hit that theme, right? One thing can do many, and it can do more. And the more is that shape. It's a hockey stick. It's going to be a little slow in the beginning, but you build momentum, and it's huge. So there's the, the pain and the promise So I get around the one thing. What are we trying to prevent? This kind of stressed out haziness about our focus. 
And the promise is really, really extraordinary results if you're willing to line up your dominoes. The stuff that gets in the way, and this is kind of a longer section of the book, and it's where we put a lot of our research, are the six lies. And in the time we have today, I'm not going to go through them, but I want to hit a couple that we lead with. These are the things that we think make sense that actually don't. Um, The first lie we said is everything matters equally. That in a world of too many choices, too many obligations, and to-do lists that get too long, in our rush to try to do everything, we end up treating pretty much everything as if it's equal. Even if we don't argue for it, we act that way. And the example I like to give people is that if your to-do list is really, really long and you're stressed out, most people will fall back at some point or another to, instead of doing the most important thing on their list, they'll do the stuff that they can knock off the fastest. They're actually just trying to shorten the list for psychic relief. And so the first big lesson of the book is let's take this idea of priority and apply it to our to-do list. You know, good old Pareto's principle. You know, 80% of what you get is from 20% of what you do. Take your list and of all the things that you could do, identify the handful that you should do. It's usually going to be a list of about four or five things. And we want you to launch your days with number one. If you get finished with number one, great, hit number two. But at the end, one, two, three, if you're doing it in priority, really successful people just have an amazing day before noon. It's because they launch them with priority. And we call that turning your to-do list into a success list. Um, The next big thing that gets in the way is when people are trying to do too much, they try to do two things at once, and it's multitasking. That's a lie. And I could go through, I've given hour-long presentations in front of big corporations just on this, but the big misconception is that they're doing things faster or that they're somehow defying odds and being more effective. And the research is real, real clear. Um, There's a guy named Clifford Nass that was uh, a, a former scientist at Stanford University. In 2009, he designed a study not to disprove multitasking, but to figure out how well they did it. And he got over 200 students, that was half of them being really good at multitasking supposedly and half of them not, and gave them a battery of tests. And quoting him, he said, what I discovered is that going in, I thought that they had this special unique quality, but really they're suckers for irrelevancy. And in every single test, the multitasking people had performed worse than the low multitasking people, even on a test of multitasking. And it just cracked him up, but it was absolutely true, is that when you try to do things at once, you lose time and efficiency. Now, what actually is happening here, and we'll just kind of, kind of shortcut this with our time, is that you're switching back and forth so rapidly you think you're doing two things at once. But people are losing time every time they switch. You have to reorient to the rules. If you're writing a long essay, you know, three or four paragraph email, and someone interrupts you, you have that moment, hey, I'm sorry, what did you just say? Because you knew they were talking, but you didn't switch in your mind. That lag time, researchers say, costs us about 28% of the average workday because people are juggling phone calls and emails. Not only is there the lag of you switching, but then when you get back to your email, you have to start reading it over again. And we just don't register this huge inefficiency. So that had a big hit on me as an entrepreneur. If the average worker is losing 28% of their day to these switching costs and they're being less effective, man, my four people... You know, or if I have five people, they're doing the work of four. If I am being ineffective this way, I might only be working four days even though I'm being in the office five. So this idea of multitasking has a real cost, and it really would measure up in the hundreds of millions. So there's a couple of the things that we kind of identify on a real practical level. Look, when you identify your number one thing each day, don't multitask then. We're not trying to cure people of multitasking all the time, but we want practical solutions. Figure out what your number one is, launch it at the beginning of the day, and don't multitask while you do it. So kind of you get through the lies, and the other ones are about willpower. They're about habit formation so that you can kind of line those up. And the heart of the book is a very humble question. We call the focusing question. And if there was one habit we wanted people to take away, it's this idea of, Right now, what's my priority? And we want them to say this question. What's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? And that question was actually formed through years and years of consulting with entrepreneurs. And the short version of it is, 
Jerry was working with these entrepreneurs on a coaching call. They'd make an agreement about what would be done between now and the next week. And invariably, these were really successful people. They would do some of the things they agreed to, but not the most important thing. And out of frustration, he started saying, well, if you'd only do three things this week so that you could move this ball forward, what would they be? And then they'd come back and they'd do like two and three, but not number one. And it was really in frustration that he kind of first articulated, look, if you can only do one thing this week, such that by doing it, everything would be easier and necessary, what's that going to be? And when those people identified it, he discovered something amazing. One, they all started doing it. If you only have one thing on your list, there's no place to hide. You either did it or you didn't. You can't say, but I did this instead. They said yes or no. So there was instant accountability. There was instant focus. And the people who started doing that, their p and started changing rapidly. And that's when this really became ensconced in our, in our business philosophy. So it's what's the one thing I can do? Not two things or three things. And it's not should or would do. It's can do. Let's get into action right now. It's like the Shel Silverstein poem. All the woulda, coulda, shouldas all ran away and hid from one little did. Right? Let's get into action. And then the rest of it is such that by doing it just means that anything you do is going to have another domino. Right? It's a levered activity. It's going to have a disproportionate impact. And the scale of that is everything's going to be easier and necessary. And when people ask that question, it's pretty amazing. We've consulted with hundreds of them in several big, big companies. They know their answers. A lot of times, they just weren't trusting them. But you're looking for the biggest lever in your life right now. And so we want people to start using that to launch their days and their weeks. And the simple application, right, answering that question, which we found people are pretty accurate, and doing it are two things. And our solution for that is something we've been teaching for gosh, 15 years in our organization, when you identify your one thing, the best way to get people to do it is to make an appointment with themselves to do it. We call it time blocking. And it sounds really simple, right? I'm going to put it on my calendar, but most people use their calendars in order to schedule meetings with other people. And in our research, the most successful people use their calendars primarily not to meet with other people, but to schedule time for themselves to do their most important work. And it's amazingly how it works and the science lines up. Um, There was a study that came out just three years ago that was in the British Journal of Medicine. And they asked a large group of people to take on 20 minutes of exercise a day. And they had three groups, a control group, a motivation group, and what they called an intention group. The control group was just asked to do it. The motivation group was told, and they read every day this little pamphlet about the benefits of 20 minutes of exercise. Those two groups collectively were about 35% effective, right? 35% of the time they exercised. The intention group had everything the motivation group did. They were told the same information. They were given a pamphlet to read every day. They had to do one extra thing. They had to commit in writing, on this day, at this time, in this place, I will exercise for 20 minutes a day. And the results are pretty astounding. They were 91% effective, more than three times more effective And what I tell people, knowing why you need to do something is important, being motivated, but knowing when and where you need to do it is where the rubber hits the road. It makes you three times more effective. And it's something we've been preaching for years, and it is highly effective. So you identify your one thing. You make an appointment with yourself to do it on a regular basis, and then you let that lead your results. And kind of the last little practical thing, and we'll kind of tie this up, right? And this is just the heart of the book. There's a lot of research around it, is that once you have your time block, we want people to protect it. And what we saw is a lot of people would have the appointment show up, but they would not have a place where they could effectively work. So we teach people, it's four steps, build a bunker, find a place in your life, whether it's at home, in the office, in Starbucks, wherever, that you can really get focused and be able to give your full attention to the things that matter most. Two, store provisions. Once you have that place, make sure that you have everything that you need to work. You know, you don't need to step out for coffee after 30 minutes of really great focus and have someone snipe you. Oh, hey, Jay, I I saw that you just stepped out of the writing room. I just have one quick question. Well, that could cost you an hour of your really prime time. So we just say, don't leave the room if you can possibly avoid it. Store those provisions. Um, I carry a backpack. Gary does. I've got power bars. I've got water. Everything I need for us to do our work. 
Three, sweep for minds. For most people, is turn off your dadgum cell phone or at least turn off the notifications. You don't need little things popping up on your screen or on your cell phone telling you to check Twitter and Facebook, right? Just remove things that you know are a distraction from your immediate environment. And lastly, enlist support. People always underestimate how much the people in their environment will come and help them if they'll just tell them why keeping this time is important. You know, we found the 10,000 hour rule like everyone else. The people who are most successful put in about four hours a day over time to become amazing at what they do. And so telling the people around you is like, look, I'm committed to launching this business. And the most precious time to me is these few hours in the morning when I'm really going to try to be productive. I really hope, help, hope you can help me keep that time my focus time. And in our experience, people will absolutely protect the entrepreneur from themselves because we self-sabotage more than anyone else. So that's kind of, boy, what a challenge to kind of take a 230-page book and drop it into this kind of format. But to me, if you had to distill it, those are kind of the big points, right? What's the big idea? What are the two biggest things that get in our way? And I think that's this, this idea of trying to do too much, everything matters equally, and multitasking. How do you focus? We have that simple question that's very effective. And then how do you get it done? You time block that work. You make an appointment with yourself and you go to your bunker, your productivity place. That's your ritual place to work. And that's where you get your work done. So that's the one thing in about, I guess, seven and a half minutes. How did I do? You did excellent. And like you said, that is a big challenge and you did a phenomenal job. And this next question, you know, I started thinking about it while you were talking because it fits in so well with this book. You, you might even think that we uh, we wrote this knowing that you were coming on, but this is the question that we ask every single time. And it's, if the reader could only take away one concept, principle, or action item out of the entire book, I mean, this is definitely like the principle of the one thing, but uh, what would you what would you guys want that to be? Well, you know, I said it, and when I was saying it, I thought, oh gosh, I just answered the question for after mm-hmm. this. <laughs> no, no, exactly it's, um, I want people to internalize this idea of the focusing question. Um, I think a lot of times we are not appropriate in our moments because we're not really clear about where we're going. And asking the question, right? What's my one thing today? What's my one thing this week? What's my one thing this month or this year? When you have that answer, you need to hold on to it because that allows you to say no to stuff and it allows you to say really yes. And people often mis- asking the question, we always said that's the success habit. That's the number one habit that we found in common with all the people that we interviewed for this book is that in their own words, right, they got clarity about the most important thing for their business or their work day. And they attack that thing with just religious fervor. Hmm. So Jay, we've pulled so many different quotes out of this interview so far. And I know there's a ton. Uh, The book is chock full of amazing quotes as well. But do you have a favorite quote from the book? And and will you will you explain it a little bit? Oh, yeah. It's just one of the ones like I, you know, as a business author, I also love to kind of check our hashtag and see what people are sharing. And one of the most shared ones in the book is this idea that you need to be doing less with more effect instead of doing more with side effects. Mm. And that concept and the people who are sharing it kind of get it. And it, it got me too. I'm so ambitious and I've got that entrepreneur mindset. I've got four businesses that we're currently running. I definitely get that thing. And if you're not lining things up and saying no, you can absolutely get the side effects. I mean, in Gary's life, and we share this in the book, he literally was hospitalized at one point because he put himself in such a stressful state by trying to do too much. Wow. And it is so amazing the relief you get by identifying the clear priority because it just makes it easy to say no. So you know what? That sounds like an awesome opportunity, but I'm going to pass. And I used to not act that way. So I love that quote because it it gets me to that sense of clarity that we all want to have. No, that's perfect. And Jay, do you have time for an audience question? Sure. Excellent. So, so Tia Johnson actually asked this and she said, what's the one thing you could advise for someone new in business to stay on track, not lose focus on the excitement and to start a routine that will take him or her far in their routine slash career? Wow. I love that question. So thank you. I think you said Tina for asking it. Tia, yeah. There, there are two things that immediately come to mind, and it really depends on how early you are in the journey. 
Um, my first thing would be, and we didn't cover it, but a huge, huge thing is willpower. And we discovered in our research that you have the most in the morning. And I think that the most successful people in this world, I mean, one, I said they, they have an amazing day before noon. But on average, millionaires are up and active two hours before they have to be at work. They are exercising. They are reading for self-improvement. They're not doing that in the evening when things happen and they're too sleepy and fall asleep on the couch. They take their mornings and they make sure they launch them with energy and they launch them with self-improvement and health. They really get a lot of stuff before 8 o'clock. So I would say start taking your most important things and move them up early in the day. And I think I said that in the speech. The other thing that comes to mind immediately is when you look at really successful people, they have that mindset. And the thing that they all have in common, almost all of them have a coach. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a coach, I would look into finding one, either a formal one you pay or a mentor, someone who will hold you accountable to start making these changes in your life. Because behavior change is tough. It's nice to have someone who's asking you the question, how'd you do this week or this month? So Jay, before we started talking or before we jumped on the interview, you told me how much you uh, were a book lover. And so I, I love that. Uh, I'm excited for this part of every interview, but extra excited for this one because uh, of how much you read. So if there's only one book you could recommend to our listeners based on the way that it's impacted your life, maybe created a paradigm or a lifestyle shift, what would you recommend? Oh, man, I hated this question because for me, it's torture. I look around and all of my walls are literally covered in books. Um, I, I've got two shelves that I consider my special shelves. But I asked the question, OK, instead of saying for my whole life, which I just I can't answer this past year, the book I've probably given out to more people than any other is actually kind of an essay that's been made into a book by Peter Drucker. It's called Managing Oneself. Mm. And it's a very, very simple treatise. Um, usually to the younger person, but boy, it resonated with me um, about how you can manage your own professional career and take complete ownership over it. And it echoed a lot of the things that we, we felt in the book. And it also was about feedback and mentality. But, you know, like 45 pages, quick read. Uh, I thought it was pretty golden. Um, and he, to me, is the management guru. If you're only going to read one leadership author, you're going to read Drucker, in my opinion. So I thought it was his, his, his best, most condensed work. No, that's fantastic. And, and it's another book that we have not had recommended yet, surprisingly. I mean, we're on episode 159. And uh, I don't believe, I might be mistaken, but I don't believe we've actually had that recommended yet. So I always love, uh, always love the new recommendations. There we go. We've added one to your short list, I hope. <laughs> short list. <laughs> right. Uh, Jay, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to not only get more information on you, but also on the book, The One Thing? Um, our website is kind of a great clearinghouse. We have a lot of free tools there and there's ways that you can contact me as well. And it's the one thing.com with the number one. So the number one thing.com and my name, Jay Papazan. Um, I'm probably one of the more Googleable authors out there because it's easy to spell and very distinct. So I'm, I'm active on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. Um, I wrote a book on social media, so I try to check those channels if not daily, then at least weekly. So a lot of people reach out to me with specific questions, and I do my very best to answer them quickly. Excellent. Well, Jay, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your book with us. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you'd like more information on Jay or the book, The One Thing, check out the show notes at the elpodcast.com. And as always, and you want to listen in, if you want a free copy of The One Thing, Check out the same website, the elpodcast.com, and become a VIP. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.